good morning in California and uh, good day wherever in the world you are. I'm very happy to greet you and welcome you to this uh, webinar where we're going to be talking about some very interesting subjects and uh, I'm going to give you some uh, maybe disturbing information so I want you to be uh, aware of that and uh, as Gaston mentioned we will have a question and answer period. Here at the Oasis of Hope, we have been treating uh, cancer patients for the last almost 50 years. And um, uh, we have uh, seen that um, there, there are many things wrong with the way we study cancer, the way we research cancer. And uh, I want to give you some background on, on this before we go into the subject of stage 4 cancer. As Gasson mentioned, uh, most of the patients that come to us come in stage 4. For those of you that do not understand the staging of cancer, the staging goes from one to four. One, uh, stage one is when we find the cancer in its earlier stage where it usually can be curable uh, with uh, surgery. And stage four is where the cancer has spread away from the original site. Let's say that the original cancer started in the breast it will be considered stage four if this cancer is now found in a different type of organ, let's say the lungs or the liver. And uh, so it doesn't matter how much tumor load, that is a stage four uh, cancer because you may have a very small tumor in the breast and a very small tumor in the lung. It is still stage four. Um, and, uh, uh, we have been striving uh, for the last 75 years, as far as re research is concerned, to be able to help patients in stage four because unfortunately, not only us, but most oncologists are going to receive patients in stage four because cancers tend to be very insidious or slow growth and without any symptoms. And by the time a patient develops symptoms, it's usually because the cancer has spread away from its original site. Uh, site. So let me begin with a uh, quote from uh, George Orwell. He said, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. Why am I quoting him? Because I believe, and as I will show you in the next uh, few minutes, that there is um, only half-truths or actual lies being told to us uh, in, in, in the matters of uh, cancer research. And um, according to the American Cancer Society, facts and figures from 2010, um, from 1930 to 1970, there was a, a, a very important increase in the incidence of cancer, both in men and in women, so that by 1970, uh, about uh, 180,000 men were dying of cancer and 150,000 women were dying of cancer. And uh, for a country that was um, already very developed in 1970, this was unacceptable. And so the President of the United States, in his um, address to the nation in 1971, in the State of the uh, Nation's address, he uh, uh, um, occupied a, a few minutes and, and said a hundred words uh, on, on cancer and he decided to officially, at that time, declare the war on cancer. And he promised that in 10 years, if sufficient funds would be granted to the National Cancer Institute, a cure would be found. And uh, this was very exciting news at the time. Uh, Nixon didn't want to stay behind Kennedy that put men on the moon that you know, were able to come back. And so um, money started going to the NCI in droves in order to find the cure for cancer. Well, now I don't have to tell you that that didn't happen. We have nothing to show for all the money. Let me just tell you the uh, cancer war budget in 2007, and I'm putting 2007 because um, I, I was not able to find the current uh, amounts, but it's about 25% more 
of what it was in 2007. And it was $17.3 billion just for that year. Um, for, of those $17.3 billion, $5.9 billion go to the NCI just about every year. About another billion to the NIH, only for the research of cancer, although the, the NIH are many institutes. Another to the uh, can, uh, disease uh, control in, in uh, Atlanta, another 314 billion, again, only for cancer. The Pentagon, the, that is the uh, Department of Defense, also uh, does uh, quite a bit of research for cancer, about 250 million. Uh, the Veterans Administration Hospitals also received for research, not for treatment, 457 uh, million. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry receives from the government about $7.4 billion. And on top of it, they also spend about 25% of their annual research and, and uh, uh, developing uh, on, on cancer. And then there are private donations, and that amounts to two billion dollars. And this goes to cancer charities, cancer centers, and research hospitals, especially in America, but also around the world. So there's a tremendous amount of money going into the research of cancer. And as I tell you, in almost 50 years, we have very little to to show for it. Um, so what have we uh, obtained from all of this uh, monies that have gone into cancer? Well, there's the emergence of biotechnology that has been very helpful. Uh, and now we have the human genome that 10 years ago we thought that it was going to be the solution to all of the diseases of, uh, uh, of the human race. Uh, unfortunately, still nothing has come uh, from that um, incredible achievement. Then the unprecedented ability to use specific molecular targeting. And this is something that uh, we have been able to uh, exploit in the correct way to, uh, to help people by finding out the metabolic pathways, the signaling pathways of, uh, of cells in order to, to understand what is it that they do. And if uh, we, uh, we have been able to find the uh, metabolic signaling pathways of malignant cells, and uh, by knowing this, we're able to interfere with them, and we have been able to develop a number of therapies based on this. Gleevec, for instance, is one of them. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a, a quite effective treatment uh, for leukemias, and it is not chemotherapy. It is a, a transduction uh, uh, signaling therapy that, that is a, a therapy that interferes with the signaling pathways of malignant cells, thus uh, not allowing them to, to grow. We at the Oasis of Hope Hospital have been using this uh, incredible research uh, in findings to interfere with metabolic pathways of malignant cells because uh, research uh, have published that what controls these uh, signals are nutrients. And so by providing the correct nutrients, we can derail the uh, metabolic pathways of malignant cells and thus kill them. Um, uh, also, there have been development of new uh, agents due to this research. As I mentioned, Gleevec is one of them. Uh, and it's all through genetic engineering. Then uh, we have been able to uh, get much better uh, machines to detect and, and treat cancer, like new radiation uh, therapy machines that are incredible as far as di uh, directing the dosage directly to the tumor, uh, lowering the damage to a nearby tissue. And uh, of course, to detect, we have incredible toys now available to, to us, like the PET scan, CAT scans. Uh, and a number of other uh, new machines that uh, help us uh, diagnose our patients uh, in, in a much more effective and efficient way. Uh, but um, as far as helping patients survive cancer, we have not been able to do that. In spite of all of that money, uh, from 1972 that the war was declared, and as I, sh uh, I showed you, a little bit over 300,000 patients died in 72 uh, um, 
of cancer. A decade later, in 1982, close to 450,000 patients died of cancer in spite of all of that money. And obviously, in that decade, the cure didn't come. Uh, Ten years later, the um, number of deaths increased uh, to more than 500,000. And uh, by 2002, it increased by over 550,000. And it has continued to increase since that time. But, uh, you know, the, the, the only good doctors in, in research, I believe, are the spin doctors because now they've been trying to uh, sort of justify their very, very poor results. And Samuel Roeder, which was the NCI director in 1990 in a Congress in Hamburg, said uh, in, in order to justify the failure, he said, although we are still searching for answers, the hallmark of the 90s will be the application of research results from the 80s. And he was talking about all of those things that we learned about biotechnology. And then uh, we were not able to find the cure. But in the 90s, for sure, he was saying we will find. And of course, you know, we're at the end of the uh, decade of, I mean, we're at the beginning of the second decade of, uh, of a new millennium. And we still have nothing to show for it. Another director of the uh, um, um, NCI said, progress in cancer research is in, the, in the 80s has led to predictions of major improvements in cancer prevention and treatment in the 90s. So he was talking about you know, these new type of chemotherapies and magic bullets that, that were going to cure cancer in the 90s. And of course, we know that didn't happen. I, again, Samuel Brothers said, Another very interesting thing, and since we are in Mexico, I, I wanted to show you this. He said, poverty is a risk factor for cancer incidence and mortality rates. No access to screening procedures or to state-of-the-art medical care actually increases the possibility of, of you dying of cancer. And, and I found this uh, to be uh, quite interesting because at that time, if you might remember, there was the famous North American uh, treaty, the NAFTA. And what they wanted to do is counteract the, the uh, European Union uh, by joining Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Um, and that was called NAFTA. And so the Mexican government, the Mexican National Academy of Science in 1993, then did an evaluation of the health scores of the three countries because the biggest burden for Mexico in order to be able to join NAFTA was health care. And so our country did an evaluation of the health of Mexico, USA, Canada, and they found that definitely uh, the health score, and, and they had several ways of measuring this in US, and the US was much better than Mexico, but it was interesting to find that the health score of Canada was better. And, and the question why was why, and, and so the first idea was that, you know, money. How much money were these three countries spending? And uh, for every one dollar that Mexico spends in healthcare, the U.S. spends a thousand dollars. And so maybe that was the reason why the score in the USA was better. But in Canada, they spend ten times less, and they their health score is better. So money does not necessarily translate into a better health score. So the second question was the amount of doctors per capita. And uh, in Mexico, we have 130 doctors per 100,000 population. And in America, you have uh, 586. So maybe this was the reason why the health score is better. Uh, <clears throat> surprisingly, in Canada, they only have 57. If you want to interpret this, is that the more doctors you have, the, the the sicker or, or the less well uh, patients fare. And, and I know this may sound unfair to you, but there are many reports in the literature that show that um, when doctors go on strike, the death rate actually drops. Um, I, you know, it's, it's sad for me to say that, uh, but uh, when I learned that after 11 years of studying uh, uh, to become a specialist in oncology just to find out that I was a menace to society was not uh, very encouraging. So I decided to change 
my philosophy, and I'll talk. To, I, I will talk a little bit about that. So more spin. <clears throat> By now, you know, from 1970 to now, uh, both uh, death rates in women and in men increased. But in 2003, there was a major uh, breakthrough in. Uh, was stated all over the news that for the first time the cancer mortality dropped in America. And it dropped in men. And the drop from 2002 to 2003, according to them, was amazing. 778 less men died in, in 2003 in comparison to 2002. That is, you know, from the uh, 280,000 that died, uh, 70, 778, obviously, for those men is, is wonderful, but uh, in my opinion, is, is not important. Unfortunately, they forgot to mention that the death rate in women increased by 499 case, cases. So the net decrease was 369 after, you know, more than $250 billion in research. Uh, so they're claiming that that 1% is incredible. So to date, cancer kills nearly 1,500 Americans. And uh, the, according to the American Cancer Society, there has been a 1% decrease per year since 2003. But that was only to 2006. After 2006, we have gained all of those, we have lost all of those gains. And now the death rate is above what it was in 2003. Now, what about the novel treatments that have been developed due to all of this uh, research? I will talk about two of the most important ones, Avacin and Ervitux, that are now widely used. And they were both approved in 2004 for cancer of the colon and cancer of the rectum. Uh, first, I've asked, and what were the, the results? Combined with standard chemotherapy, it improved the survival by a median of 4.7 months. So terminal cancer uh, uh, survival rates is 16 months, and it improved by four months. Um, as I had a patient tell me here, if I would have known, oh, no, a, a prior uh, trial on cancer of the breast failed completely. It didn't help at all. And the cost of these uh, therapies is incredible. Approved for third line herbitux, which is similar. Both are anti-angiogenetic factors. Um, uh, herbitux was approved as a third line uh, therapy. Uh, and there was significant tumor reduction. But it also only increased the uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm having here a technical problem. I can't go forward. Now, OK. There was no survival increase whatsoever with Herbitux. It costs you $10,000, you or your insurance company, a month to have these therapies. Uh, a patient of mine told me, if I would have known this uh, for my father, I mean, not uh, the son of a patient, I probably would have spent you know, the forty dollars or $50,000 uh, taking my dad around the world, and he probably would have enjoyed that better than the therapy. Um, Herbitrix is a little bit less expensive, but not by much, as you can see. So uh, in spite of all of the advances um, in developing this extremely complicated drugs, they're called um, monoclonal anti uh, antigen therapies, uh, the results have not been very good. And it's disheartening to find that, you know, in 1950, the death rate uh, for heart disease was uh, 586 or 87 pa uh, uh, patients per 100,000 population. Of uh, cerebrovascular diseases, or stroke, was 180. And in cancer, was 194 uh, per 100,000 population. Look at this. In heart or cardiovascular diseases, the drop has been dramatic from 586 in 1950 to 231 in 2003, and for stroke, from 180 to 53. Yet in cancer, where there's been a lot more money spent, it stayed virtually the same. The drop has been from 194 to 190. Nothing rude to write home about. 
Now, the five-year survival rate is the big thing that we are pushing now that, uh, you know, uh, even if we're not curing people, we are helping them live longer. And so only 50% uh, survived. All stages, all cancers survived in 1971, and now it's 63%. The truth is that what's happening is that because of the new tools that we have, we're just diagnosing the patients earlier. And so there are, there's a number of reports there that show that the, uh, here the five-year survival rate is from diagnosis to, to, to five years. Well, since our tools can diagnose earlier, people are dying at the same rate. They're just being diagnosed earlier, and that's why they live longer. Uh, or the, 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 it appears that the survival rate is for more people. The dramatic increases in cures and longevity have been spectacular in several tumors. Hodgkin's uh, uh, lymphoma, some leukemias in children, thyroid carcinoma, testicular carcinoma, and childhood cancers. Outside of these tumors that are not very common, uh, the results have been very, very bad. And all of those gains were measured in months, and uh, also they came in the early days of the war on cancer, not lately. So um, all of these discoveries have really not proven to, to help uh, cancer patients a lot. And the incidence of cancer continues to skyrocket uh, since the war on cancer began. To date, 1.5 million new cases will uh, happen just this year in America. And the, de the birth to death incidence of cancer is about one in two uh, in men and one in three women will develop cancer during uh, their lifespan. Uh, so that's not very encouraging. Um, the reason why we're having this is, is because of how we're doing research. So the mandate from the FDA is that it must be safe and effective. And in order for you to prove that uh, your drug is safe and effective, you have to spend about $800 billion on what they're calling proper science. $800 million. So the industry responds to that by complying with the procedures, that is, playing by the rules, in profitability, that is, exploit the rules. I am going to spend those $800 million for, for me to obtain a, pat, obtain a patent, and then I will have a monopoly of this rule, which is only fair to uh, uh, make that money back. My contention is that this is the wrong philosophy to work. We need to change that. And um, uh, after a, a, a few words from Gaston, I will uh, come back and talk to you about what we feel that it's the right philosophy, what is it that we do at the Oasis of Hope, and why our results have been so much better than any competition around the world. Okay, so um, as I mentioned uh, to you before, um, I believe strongly that the reason for the failure in cancer, especially in the United States of America, but also Europe is not due to a lack of, um, of brains. I think that uh, some of the most brilliant minds in the world are involved in, in cancer research. I also do not think that it's lack of, of commitment. I think that uh, these uh, very intelligent people are, are also extremely committed uh, to uh, cancer research. And I also don't think that it's lack of funds, as I mentioned uh, and, and showed the was able to show to you the uh, amount of money that, uh, that just the USA is spending is staggering and also Europe is spending a lot of money on it. So why are we failing? Well, I, I, at the end of uh, the first segment I mentioned that it was philosophical and uh, I will explain why I believe that the problem with research is philosophical rather than technical. At the Oasis of Hope Hospital, we base all of our treatments and research on two very important philosophical principles. The first one is from the father of uh, medicine, Hippocrates. He said, primum 
which in Latin is in Latin and in English it means first do no harm. And I can tell you that uh, most cancer uh, um, specialists will break this rule in a heartbeat. What do I mean by that? Most of the therapies that we give are going to deteriorate the quality of life of our patients without much benefit. As I showed you, uh, if we increase the lifespan of a patient by less than five months with a therapy that devastates their quality of life, we are not adhering to this first do no harm uh, principle. And the second principle is what Jesus said. Love your neighbor as your friend, as, as, you, as yourself. We have um, uh, paraphrased that into love your patient as you love yourself. And uh, uh, if, if a doctor is offering a therapy that would not receive himself, and I can tell you that uh, most oncologists will not touch chemotherapy at all. That is not loving your patient as yourself. All of the therapies that we develop at the Oasis of Hope are therapies that we ourselves would take in case or if we were diagnosed with a malignancy. Based on these two uh, very, very philosophical principles, our therapies then are, are, are designed. And by changing the philosophy, what changes? What, why, what is the philosophy of the research community in the world? Well, it is really a tumor versus patient. In the, uh, it, it makes sense, you know, at the beginning, if, if you say, well, I have a tumor and this tumor is threatening my life, I want to get rid of it. So philosophically, the world is researching tumors, not patients. And I'll give you an example. In the United States of America, about 95% of the budget spent on research goes to the study of primary tumors. Again. That sounds logical, you know, if I want to cure cancer of the breast, I must know everything that, it, that there is to know about cancer of the breast. And metastases are, uh, uh, are seldom studied because they're complicated to, to study, and only 5 to mo at most 10 percent of the budget for research goes to the study of metastases. Now, let me tell you that 95 percent of the patients die due to metastasis, and virtually no patient will die from a primary tumor. So you see, philosophically, we're spending all of the money in what doesn't kill patients, and we spend very little money in what really kills a patient. So if we are behind this uh, philosophy of what happens to the tumor, we measure success on what's happening to the tumor. That's why we continue to have very positive reports about research on cancer, in spite of the fact that more people are dying this year than the year before. And so <clears throat> what we spin is what happens to the tumor. So if I develop a therapy that reduces the size of the tumor, it is considered to be su successful, obviously, regardless of what pa happens to the patient. <clears throat> so if the patient dies, the therapy is still consider, uh, considered effective. So uh, uh, my position would be, you know, that, that should be called a successful failure. Why? Because the therapy successfully diminished the tumor size, but the patient died. In my opinion, I'd rather have failed successes because most of the therapies that we give at the Oasis of Hope does, do not necessarily get rid of the tumor, but our patients are alive after many, many years. Patients that were told that they were going to die in three to six months <coughs> are alive after 15 years. But if we take x-rays, we still have tumors there. So from the philosophy a point of view of research, that patient is a failure because the tumor is still there, but the patient is alive. So I call those failed successes. And I think that most patients would rather be alive with tumors than dead without tumors. And, and so uh, philosophically that is very, very different. And uh, so our philosophy is to help and provide the patient with resources for them to have a long and a life with quality. That is our aim. Our aim is the patient 
and the tumor for us is completely secondary. And so that's the main difference in our philosophical approach to cancer from the rest of the world. Based on this philosophy, our, tre our treatments are holistic. That is, we're not just going to treat the patient physically, but we're also going to provide resources at the emotional level and in the spiritual, uh, spiritual sphere. This is very, very important. When you provide a patient with um, emotional and spiritual resources, patients are going to do much better. Then, based on this philosophy, our treatments are also eclectic. We are not alternative. We are not orthodox. If an orthodox therapy is developed in the states that we feel that is the best for our patients, we are going to apply it. If there is a a, a nutrient uh, uh, that has been published uh, from German researchers that uh, will help a tumor reduce in size, we are going to do that as well. So we are going to put all of the pieces to the puzzle uh, together in order to help a specific patient. With this philosophy, as Gasson mentioned, we've uh, treated more than 100,000 patients in all of the therapies that we give at the Oasis of Hope Hospital um, are based on state-of-the-art research. And so we have interventive therapies like uh, surgery, chemotherapy, uh, radiation therapy, or pharmaceutical, any type of uh, new drugs or new old drugs that are out there that we would feel that are good to our patients based on our philosophy we want to use. And we use a number of nutraceuticals because we have found that nutrients uh, sometimes work a lot better than many of the harsh therapies um, given to therapies, uh, uh, to our patients. As I mentioned to you, uh, for us, emotional and spiritual support is extremely effective. And due to this, we have been able to uh, um, increase the, the survival of our patients with quality, which is what is most important to us. So we are in a new era of complementary therapies, which is now being called integrative regulatory therapy. We've been doing this for almost 50 years. And let me tell you that the Society for Integrative Oncology in the United States of America is about three years old. So we've been way ahead of our time. In, in, in our philosophical concepts, and because of that, our results are much better. One of the big problems uh, uh, for anybody that's working under this philosophy is to compete with the other philosophy, because um, research is done on one element at a time, and, and uh, the FDA requires that you prove that one element, how that works, and what are the results. And as you see in our integrative therapy, we give at least 88 different types of therapies to our patients, and every therapy has a number of elements. So a patient is receiving hundreds of elements, and it is very difficult to determine which one of those elements worked for that patient, because maybe two or three elements worked in one patient, and three other or four different elements work for a different patient. The patient doesn't care, and we really don't care. I think that in the very near future, we're going to uh, finally see some publications of what are now called full system, uh, full system therapies like ours, where you cannot determine specifically what element worked, because it really doesn't matter as long as the patients live longer and better. Now, based on, on this uh, philosophy, let me give you some, some uh, results of uh, studies that we have done at the Oasis of Hope Hospital with full system treatments in, in uh, uh, several cancers. So let me start with advanced stage uh, or stage four cancer of the breast and our survival rates. Uh, and these are studies that we've done prospectively, randomized, um, in, in our hospital, because we're a small hospital and private, we cannot do double blinds. Um, so what we do is that we compare the results against the literature. The SEER, what you will see in green here, is uh, results compiled by the National Cancer Institute in uh, a number of centers around the United States of America. 
in. So after one year of therapy with conventional uh, therapies uh, in America, 65% of women are alive in comparison to 93% with our methods. And we're also comparing, uh, when available, uh, results from the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, which is somewhat similar to us, but I think we have a number of advantages and our results show that. They are also much better than the SEER uh, at 88%. Uh, after the second year, 73% uh, of our patients are alive in comparison to 44 with the SEER. Um, and uh, 63 from uh, CTCA. Uh, at the fifth year, and this is amazing, we have 45, more than twice, uh, uh, and, and Cancer Treatment Centers are, of America, they, they stop at three years. They don't provide us with four and five year results, but we do have them. And as you see, more than twice uh, uh, of our patients are alive after five years in advanced cancer of the, uh, of the breast. Now these are patients also, let me remind you, that are coming here because they were, they, they were part of the 35% of the that did not respond in America. So we have been able to recuperate a large number of patients that were sent home to die. <clears throat> Now, when the patients of uh, when, when patients in stage four uh, breast cancer come to us, version to treatment that is the patients that were not sent home to die, 100% are alive after one year, 90 after two years, 80 uh, two years, 83% after three years, and about 75 at five years. This is more than three times better than the results with conventional uh, therapy. So, as you can see. Our total care approach, our multi-prong approach, is very successful in treating women with stage four cancer of the breast. In colorectal cancer with metastasis to the liver, and this is a very complicated type of cancer. 72% of our patients are alive in comparison to 43. Uh, cancer treatment centers very similar to us, but they only have the first year. We have up to five years, and you will see that even though the number is small, it's still uh, more than twice better than with conventional therapy, and all of our patients have an incredible quality of life in comparison to <clears throat> very complicated therapies. Here, uh, I know that if patients will choose to come to us first and verge into treatment, our results will be very similar to uh, with breast cancer, but unfortunately in, in colorectal cancer we only have patients that come to us after being sent home to die. The same with lung cancer, and here uh, our results are, are, are amazing. 82% uh, after one year, 50% after two years. Uh, now let me tell you that um, th these are very happy numbers that SEER is, is putting here because most reports that you will find in the literature in stage four cancer of the breast, 99% of the patients really die within one year. And, and here they're, they're saying that 1% uh, uh, are alive after five years. This is, this is very rare. And, and yet we have almost 10% of our patients alive after 10 years. So 10 times better than with conventional therapy at five years and a uh, very high percentage of patients are alive in the first uh, three uh, years. So our results in lung cancer are very, very uh, exciting and good. Uh, ovarian cancer, as you can see, also uh, very impressive results. Almost 100% alive after one year in comparison to 62%. And at five years, more than 50% of our patients are alive in comparison to 18 years. So I can, I can tell you here that uh, philosoph philosophical principles make a tremendous difference in results. And when we put all of our efforts to helping and supporting the patient, rather than fighting tumors, the results are going to be much, much better. 
Uh, I thank you for your time. Uh, any questions that you may have, we will give you a few minutes uh, after Gaston gives the uh, final uh, uh, remarks. So please start uh, sending your, your questions and uh, we'll try to answer all of them. If we do not have time, we will post, we will post our, uh, all of the answers on our website and Gaston will talk about it.